It's uh, always a pleasure uh, to worship with you, and all the songs, I, I really enjoy it. And honestly, I have a fear of public speaking, so that's why <laughs> Trust and Obey is a good uh, song to remind me of that. Yes, I, I did have a fear of public speaking. Uh, when I first was asked to get in front of a group, I just froze. And then I was asked to preach at a conference, and I got up there, and so many people, I just froze again. But you know, the Lord is good, and he just comforted me. He said, you know, it's okay. Get up back, get up up there again. And so that's, that's what I'm doing, right? Even if I fail, uh, it's not anything too bad. Just get up and uh, rejoice that God is using me for, you know, preaching his word. So uh, today we're going to learn together um, 1 John. And I have to confess, this is like my sixth time preaching this passage. And I, I've never done that before, actually. But in all the church group that I preach, I, I felt this is the message that God wants me to uh, give uh, for this year. And I, I, I've struggled to live with this message because it is something that is, it seems so easy to have fellowship with God and have fellowship with one another. But in our church group, we have so many division, and it, it, it pains me to see the division within our own uh, churches. I thought this message to me uh, speaks uh, very strongly in my heart. And so as we uh, come, uh, let us learn together. Uh, let me pray for us before we begin. Father, we thank you for giving us this time that we come before you and your spirit just to worship you and to sing praises to you because of who you are as our Father. And we would not have you as our Father if Jesus did not die on that cross. And for him to do that, it is an ex expression of extreme love and care for us. And as for the Apostle John, he also loved us, and that's why he writes this to us, and for us to remember and to rejoice also in you. And so may you pour out your Spirit onto us. Help us to receive your word with joy, that we may live by it. And we thank you, Father. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So John, the Apostle John, is an elder. Um, and this is a time when I think he's in the island Patmos, and he's about to, you know, return with the Lord. And this week we have a news, you know, past, I don't know if you know Pastor um, Timothy Keller. He also returned to the Lord. And you know, for him, it's like a joy. And I think that's, uh, you know, when my time comes, I, I hope it is a joy uh, to be in the presence of the Lord fully. Uh, but John here is reminded of all the younger uh, brother and sister, or what he called later on in the chapter 2, is that the, the little children. That he sees them as his own children, uh, the other believers. Uh, and so for him to write this, it is a, a pastoral kind of like heart uh, that he wrote this. And he always reflect, right? And he said from the beginning, uh, he talked about life. And I think that's where, you know, all the prayer that I hear, it is our life in our seasons uh, and time uh, that we experience life and how do we look at that in terms of what God is doing. So what, he have, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. So what he's talking about is how do we experience life? If we walk throughout life just closing our eyes, closing our ears, <laughs> like, uh, not touching anything, it would be a very sad life. Right? But God wants us to enjoy the fullness of life. And it only comes through his word of life. That we, if we interpret life through our own lens, it may not sound so great. <laughs> but if we see our life live by the Word of God, it's a beautiful life. I always look back at my life before Jesus. I was like, man, that's a sad life. <laughs> but now when I look at it, even that part of my life that I live without, apart from Him, He redeemed that part. And it is a beautiful life that I live now, knowing him. So this word of life gives us a sense of filter of what we hear. Because if we listen to the culture, it's 
kind of sad, right? Um, what we see in the world now is just chaos and wars and you know famine, all this stuff. And so when we look closer at our life with God, we learn to appreciate what He has done, and all the song we sing really uh, you know a testimony to that. And so. Uh, and this life was revealed. Okay? So, so this is the life that has to be revealed to us. I didn't see it before I came to Christ. I didn't know that I have a life with God. And so it has to be revealed to us in our hearts, in our mind, in our emotion, that what God is doing in our life and what he has seen and testified and proclaimed to you the eternal life. Now, a lot of people that I talk to, Talk about eternal life as living forever. Yes, that's part of that. But the eternal life is not just living forever. The definition of eternal life, according to John in John 17, is that to know God. And this is, to me, is the most important part of our Christian life. And how do we get to know this eternal God that we will be with him forever? And we can start that now. And that, that's the beautiful part of us living here in this world can have the life eternal now. And what John also called the abundant life. And so uh, with the Father, and now revealed to us uh, that we have seen and heard proclaimed to you also so that you may have fellowship with us and indeed fellowship with the Father and Son, Jesus Christ. Now, the word fellowship, we understand a lot of time like something, having something in common uh, that we gather together is a gathering. Uh, but more than that, it is knowing a God that is invisible to us. It, it is something to grasp, right? Because I can think about things that we have in common, you know, with all of us here. But to think about what I have in common with a holy God, that's just so in awe. <laughs> Every time I think about it, I was like, really? Do I really have like this fellowship with God? That is the creator, that's the almighty, that is holy, I'm a sinner. You know, like the, the, the contrast is so far apart that it's hard for our mind to fully grasp what does it mean to have fellowship with God. But the evidence of our fellowship with God is when we have fellowship with one another. Uh, when I am asked to preach at different churches, different fellowship, my heart and understanding is that all, everyone that I, I come into contact with is my brother and sister. And that to me is something that uh, I treasure because my own family are not believers. So my father, my mom, my three sister, my brother-in-law, my niece and nephew, none of them are believers. But God gave me a promise that if I would follow him and trust him, that he would give me many, many more brother and sister, father and mothers. And that to me is a beautiful promise that even if my own biological family does not believe, and I do pray that they would believe, but even if they don't believe that I have so many more brothers and sisters that I have fellowship with, that it would comfort my heart and rejoice. Uh, because here, as I said that, I, I, I asked God, like, what is the takeaway for this message? And I think verse 4 really helped us. These things we write, so that our joy may be complete. These things we write, so that our joy may be complete. He's not writing this to make us feel good. He's actually writing this so that he would have joy that is full, completely full, overflowing joy. And I, I think about, you know, every time I get to preach the word, it gives me fullness of joy. Because you're proclaiming the truth of God to those who would want to hear it and transform by it. That to me is the considerable joy that I have in preaching 
and in teaching the Word of God. And so, uh, for every one of us here, uh, what I challenge you is, do you, you don't have to preach, right? But do you write something of your life that you experience with God, what you heard, what you've seen with your eyes, what you look at, what you touch with your hand concerning Christ? Do we write those things down for our future generation? I actually recorded myself just reading scripture and just sharing uh, what I think about the scripture for my son in the future when he's a little bit older. He's nine, turning nine. So I, I started recording that because I don't know if I'm going to pass tomorrow. <laughs> you know, like, I don't know if I'm getting out there, get a car accident and, you know, something happened, you know. So I, I leave, you know, these recording. Right? Now you can record yourself much easier than before. And so you can record yourself like, what would you say to your future generation about what you've seen, what you heard? what you've touched, what you experience with your life, that is fullness of joy for the next generation to experience that themselves. And that's our, our prayer, that what we experience of God, they may experience it even more. And that's what gives us joy when we leave these writings or recording for our future generation. So if you've never done that, okay, I would challenge you to go home and, you know, pop up your camera and your phone and just record just what has God done for you in the past, life, the life that you experienced, and share that. To me, the younger generation needs to hear those stories. There's a study, I'm going to sidetrack a little bit, there's a study um, in Fuller uh, Theological Seminary. Uh, I forgot what the study is called, but what they do, they found out that the younger generation doesn't have any story of faith from the older generation. So that's why we see this generation gap. Right? It happened in the Vietnamese church. It happened in American church. It happened in every church. It's not just the culture or anything, but it's the, the sharing of story. Because if you go back to the scripture, the scripture, the New Testament wasn't written until like maybe 30-something years after Jesus died. So how did this story carry on? Well, the Jewish people have this tradition of storytelling that everything that they hear, everything that they see, they would continue to tell. So there's like a family storytelling time that they would continue to tell the story over and over and over and become an imprint into the younger generation. Yes, they may rebel against God. Yes, they may walk away from God, but they will know that in their heart, and in their mind. So that's my challenge for us, that, that we would write this message that God has used in our life to share with the future generation. And what is this message? So verse 5 tells us that this is a message that we have heard from him and announced to you that God is light. Uh, what is light? <laughs> we need light <laughs> to see. We need light to read, to do all kind of things. Imagine we're in a life that a complete surround of complete darkness. Um, I don't know if you ever play like laser tag, <laughs> things like that. You lock into a dark room and you try to look around and try to you know, find your way about. It's hard. If we close our eyes and live our life, you know, how fast can we really walk? How much joy are we missing? We don't see the color of the sky, the trees, everything, the smile on people's face. Uh, to me, like, if you live a life that's blind, I mean, some people have that as their life. It, it is a tragedy for them to walk about life without sight. But for us, what does it mean that God is light? For us, the light is this transformational truth that we learn through the scripture. Whatever we read in the scripture, it is truth. And the truth is meant to transform us in some way to be more and more like Jesus Christ. When I came to Jesus, you know, 
I was a good kid. I went to school, I graduated college, get a job, you know, you know, normal kid's life growing up. I didn't do anything really bad. I didn't murder anyone. <laughs> I mean, I lie, like all kids lie and cheat a little bit, right? But nothing really morally bad according to my parents. You know, my parents say, I'm a good kid. But inside, there was this darkness. And the darkness consumed me a lot of time. And why do I say I have a darkness? Well, in my mind, I wanted to murder somebody <laughs> because this person hurt me when I was younger. And so when I was growing up, I always once in a while have this thought in my head that if I have a chance to go back to Vietnam and I meet this person again, I would probably kill him. <laughs> right? And so now, that's gone, okay? I just want to reassure you that that thought is gone, okay? Because I actually went back to Vietnam, sat down with that person, and bought him dinner. I was like, God bless you. And even though he may not acknowledge what he did to me was bad or wrong, um, I've forgiven him. And that freed me so much to love. Because here, here's the, the, the problem. When God is light and he's shining that light into your heart and you have anything against anybody, he will reveal that. But the thing is, what do you do with that? No one sees that. You have something against somebody that no one sees. You didn't do anything really bad. You didn't steal any money. You didn't rob anybody. You didn't hurt anybody physically. But in your mind, you have this darkness. And that alone will separate you, like you know, Rick say, will draw you away from the presence of the Lord. And I experience that. Whenever I have something against you know, my brother or sister, it, it, it divides my heart. And I cannot draw closer and know God more until I resolve this. Right? Because that's, that's the light, right? It keeps shining on you until you work it out and you choose to walk in the light. And by that, what does it mean then to walk in the light? That means we, we become transparent. Right? I have to confess that sin. Not to everybody, right? Because not everybody know my history, know my story and everything. But you, we have to have someone that we can be transparent with. And the reason for that is when you keep things in darkness, the enemy always have some kind of way to kind of speak lies into your heart and say, are you really a Christian? <laughs> if you have this harboring murder thought, murderous thought about this other person. Are you really, can you really get up here and preach while you have those thoughts, you know? And it, it, it keep, you know, pestering you because you won't share that with anyone. And so for us, the, the, the sin is that not, not just the gross sin, but what we keep hidden inside our heart that no one else know. And it keep us from getting closer to God, knowing God more intimately. So when we become transparent, whether good things or bad things, there is no condemnation. Jesus Christ's blood cover us. And in Romans 8, there is no condemnation for anyone that is in Christ. So we have no fear of confessing. I love it when I, I hear all of you just sharing prayer in my own church group when we ask for prayer. Like everybody's like, mm. <laughs> no one want to share, right? Because whether if they share something that they need, they felt like they're being pity upon, or things like that, that, that the enemy always get into our mind and won't let us open our heart to share what is deep in our heart, what we struggle with, what we need help with. And so when we become transparent and confess uh, all the things that's in our heart, that gives God's word kind of 
grip or root in your heart, to change your heart. Because if I don't deal with that darkness in my heart, I cannot say honestly that I love everybody. Right? God said to love your enemy. And if we, we're going to practice that, we cannot have any negative or hateful thoughts in our heart. And, you know, after I deal with that, God brought up something else. I've been married about 12 years, uh, going on 13 years. I have two children. And, you know, it, it's tough. I have to confess, you know, I'm bivocational. Uh, we make a decision for my wife to stay home so then she can take care of our children. And it's rough sometimes. <laughs> uh, ministry and work get a little bit busy. And, you know, when she doesn't do something that I want her to do, there's this nagging thought in my head like, She's not a good wife. <laughs> like, I, I didn't say that to her, though. Thank goodness. Right? But in my mind, I'm like, you know, she could have been better. She could do this. And I like, there's always these negative thoughts in my head about my own wife. And I recently, you know, learned that if Jesus look at his bride as blameless, that's us. And I'm looking at my bride. <laughs> I'm blaming her for everything that goes wrong in our family or marriage. I was like, that cannot be. So even that, I have to confess. And one day, I, I, after a lot of prayer, and you know, I sat down with my wife, and we had coffee after we dropped off the kid. And I just told her, you know, honey, I don't have any negative thoughts about you. And she said, well, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> But she doesn't have any thoughts about me. Whatever she feels, she speaks, and she encourages me and, you know, challenge me and correct me. But for me, like, I have so many negative thoughts that I like, if I speak, this, it's going to cause a lot of trouble. But I have to work those thoughts out with God and confessing that with God so then that sin okay, would not hinder me from having intimacy with my wife and God. That to me is the essence. If we have anything against anybody, like Matthew 5 reminds us, you know, go make peace, go reconcile. Because we deceive ourselves if we leave that in our heart and say we have fellowship with God. It doesn't work. And I can tell you there's moment in my, you know, Christian life that I feel so dry and so like one time I even asked my mentor should I even continue in ministry <laughs> because it is it's not overflowing it's, I, I don't feel close to God I felt God like so distant away and, and I didn't really understand what that, that is but God has his way of allowing you to walk a little bit further before he draw you even closer to him. And that's faith, right? That our God would never forsake us. So no matter how much we feel like we're far away or how much our sin keep us away from God, he's always there. He's faithful and righteous. And he will forgive us of anything that we ever do in our life so that we'll be cleansed from our unrighteousness. This is our testimony this is John, the Apostle John's testimony that he is cleansed from all unrighteousness. Now, not to say that we become sinless. Okay? I still have negative thoughts that I fight every day. But we make a decision to confess, to repent, and to walk with God. It's a decision we have to make every day. Just ask, I forgot her name, um, make a decision to go to church. Even though there's pain involved, there's some you know, challenges in our body, in our mind, our emotion, we have to make a decision to walk with God. 
and to have fellowship with Him, and to get rid of anything that get in the way of that. So then we can have fellowship with our brother and sister. And that to me is the the most precious gift that God gives to us. And for us to do that on a regular basis, it is to continue to receive the forgiveness of God for our own sin, and to continually forgive others. Later on, chapter two, it talk about Jesus' death on the cross not only serve as an atonement sacrifice for our sin, but for the sin of the world. What does that mean? Sometimes I think when we look at the world, it's like, man, they're just terrible sinners, <laughs> you know, doing all kind of things that is wrong, morally corrupting, you know, in the world. But Jesus also died for them. So then what is our testimony? That we were like them, but his blood cover us. And so when we look at them in the world, we need to look with the eyes of the Father that see the blood of Jesus Christ covering their sin. That is the only way for me that I can say I love everyone. Because I can see people doing wrong things all the time. But I don't hate them. But I need to tell them that their sin can be forgiven. And when we do that, it's only if we are honest with ourselves. <laughs> because if we say that we not sin, because I think a lot of time as Christians, we get into the world, and we try to write, live righteously, which is a good thing. That's what God calls us to do. But when we do sin, we kind of hide it. And when people look at us, like, oh, there you go, that perfect Christian. But they don't know what's in our heart. And so recently, God convicted me of that too. When I'm a manager at my work, and my staff came up to me and tell me something, and I just, like, dismiss her. <laughs> I was like, okay, I'm busy. Like, here, I sign it and, like, go away. Because <laughs> I had a luncheon to go to, and I was just in a rush. And I've never done that to her. But at that luncheon, I was convicted. And I say, God, say, you can't enjoy this lunch. Right? <laughs> you got to confess to her. And I had to. When I went, confessed to her, said, you know, I apologize for being rude and dismissive of you. Uh, you know, I didn't want to listen to what you have to say. And, you know, it, it's, it's uncomfortable as a boss to apologize to your staff. Uh, but it's something that God has to convict us to do. Because we're not perfect. We're not sinless. We choose to not sin, but we're not sinless because we fall into sin. I didn't want to do that to her, but sometime, you know, in our own busyness and selfishness, we sin. But when we confess it, we are proclaiming the forgiveness of God. And we are proclaiming the grace of God. And we're asking the person that we are apologizing to or confessing to to demonstrate the grace of God. It's something that, you know, it, it lacked practice in our community. Because as a pastor, and I talk to other pastors, and I, I hear a lot of pastors preaching, um, they always tell you about all the good things they do, but never anything that they're struggling with. <laughs> like one time I, I confessed to my congregation, you know, I, I'm like during my dry period, I'm, like, I'm having a hard time reading my Bible every day. And then one of the ladies come up and say, you cannot say that. You're the pastor. You cannot not read your Bible every day. I said, yes, I did. <laughs> I was like, what do you want me to say? 
You want me to lie to you and say, oh, I, I, I read my Bible every day? No. For us to be openly transparent and confessing our sin, it is a joy to the Lord. Because his word now became truth to you. And I talk to many leaders, and some of them criticize a lot of things that, you know, we do. And I ask them, when was the last time you repent of anything? They couldn't think of any. And to me, even though they are very studious and study God's word and know a lot of theology, verse 10 just kind of put them in their place. Because if you say you have not sinned, we make God a liar, and his word is not in us. So all the Bible study that you ever went to, all the sermon that you ever listened to, all the radio talk that you listened to, all the time you read your Bible on your own, it doesn't penetrate. That is <laughs> powerful. Because we can sit in the church for 20, 30 years, but we never confess anything. Then the light of God cannot shine in our heart and cannot transform us. And I, I have to say, I met you know, older brother and sister that have been in the church for 20, 30 years, and they never change. And I challenge my young people. I say, if you sit in the church for a year without actually having something in your heart change that you identify and notice by the grace of God, then there's something wrong. Because if God's word is in you, it has to change you. And if it doesn't, you have to come to God and ask why. And usually it is because we, we, we never be transparent with God. We never come to God and be honest about ourselves. And people will tell that too. Right? They, they, they can't get close to you. I, I've been my previous church for 20-something years. And there's this group of brother and sister. We call them the young couple, but they're not really young anymore. <laughs> Um, they're in their 50s, right? I still call them yourself young couple. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm heading there, so I don't try to call myself young couple anymore. Uh, but in my 20 years, all the weeks that we meet together and talk with each other and have meals together, you know, every time we meet and we say, oh, is there anything we can pray for you? Oh, everything's good, my job's good, my family's good. But his kid told me that he ran away. <laughs> but that doesn't, that's shameful, you know, as a parent, to have your kid run away. And so he, he never say that in public and ask for prayer. I mean, I'm a parent. I'm not a perfect parent. So when I do something wrong as a parent, I ask, pray, pray for me, right? To talk to my kid in a way that they would understand and all that. But he never shared that. So 20 years, I work with him as a board. He's in the board. I sit with him many hours and hours of meeting. Never share anything personal. And he remained unchanged. And that's a sad part about you know, identifying yourself as a Christian, but never actually having the word of God transforming you to be more and more like Jesus. And so our challenge is that when we have fellowship, do we honestly have nothing against each other? Because that will tell us if we truly have fellowship with God. And we're truly worshiping God. 
We can sing the most beautiful song. We can listen to the most powerful sermon. But if we have anything against anyone, and we don't confess it, we just keep it hidden in that dark little spot in our heart, we cannot have fellowship with God. And we cannot worship him or serve him. So for us, life is given to us new every day. And so when we live our life, what do we allow ourselves to hear and to see and to touch and to think about so that it would be something of a testimony for the future generation? That we don't pretend to be perfect or know everything about God, but we do know him because we have fellowship with him and we are being transformed by his truth. Later on, John is going to talk about God is love. Right? But first we have to be transformed by the light, and then we'll be transformed by his love as well. Amen? So let's stand and we'll pray. Father, we thank you that you would give us this time to come before you and your word, and to hear from you, and to see you, what you are doing in our life, every day. If we wake up and we don't think that you're doing anything, let us be reminded that you give us new breath every day. And for our body to even work, to get out of bed, to come here and to worship you, it is by your grace. I don't take that for granted. Because even as i you know, young and everything, my body can give up on me. Any time of the year, in sickness, but every day that we can get up, every day that we have breath, may we praise you. May we think about you. May we reflect upon what you've done in our life how you've been so faithful, forgiving us of all of our sin, past, present, and future, that there's no shame, there's no condemnation, that we can freely confess our sin, even the little itty-bitty one that we keep hidden in our heart, so that your light may shine fully and reveal fully the life that you want us to have, that is revealed to us through our, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we thank you, Father that you would give us the privilege to have fellowship with you and the gift of fellowshipping with our brother and sister. And for that, we thank you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.